Hello everyone and welcome to today's pan uh, discussion session uh, which is conducting pen testing in cloud setting to secure business environments and I am Ritika Chakraborty and I will be your host for the day. Before we get started uh, we would like to go over a few house rules for our attendees. The session will be in listen only mode and will last for an hour, out of which the last 10 minutes will be dedicated to QA. If you have any questions during the webinar to the organizer or our speaker, use the QA window. Also, if you face any audio video challenges, please check your internet connections or you may log out and log in again. And very important announcement for our audience. As a commitment to closing the cybersecurity workforce gap by creating multi-domain cyber technicians, EC Council pledged $3.5 million toward, toward CCT education and certification scholarships to certify approximately 10,000 cyber professionals ready to contribute to the industry. Did you know that you can be part of the lucrative cybersecurity industry? Even top companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, Facebook and Dell all hire cybersecurity professionals. The cybersecurity industry has a 0% unemployment rate. The average salary for an entry-level cybersecurity job is about $100,000 per year in the United States. Furthermore, you don't need to know coding and learn from your home, and you get a scholarship to kickstart your career. Apply now. EC Council is pledging a $3.5 million CCT scholarship for cybersecurity career starters. Scan the QR code on the screen to apply for the scholarship. Fill out the form. To know more about the program, please uh, go to our uh, website. Uh, the link is given in the chat section. Also, we would like to announce to our audience about the special handouts. Take the screenshot of this running webinar and post in your social media, LinkedIn or Twitter, tagging EC Council with hashtag CyberTalks. We will share free handouts to first 50 audience. Now about our speaker. Sergey is a security and cloud expert, instructor with 15 plus years of experience in Microsoft technologies. His day-to-day -day job is to help companies securely embrace cloud technologies. He has certifications and recognitions such as Microsoft MVP, Security OC, OSCP, OSEP, ECPPT, ECPTX, Microsoft Certified Trainer, MCT Regional Lead, EC Councils, CEX, CPAN, LPT, CC, CCSC, and more. Sergey often speaks at local and international conferences like Global Azure, DEF CON, Black Hat Europe, Wild West Hacking Fest, Security Besides, Workplace Ninja, Midwest Management Summit, Hack in the Box, and etc. So, right now, without any further delay, I am handing over the mic to you, Sergey. All right. Uh, can you hear me well? Um, at least I can hear me. I can hear myself. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Good. Uh, just to help you a bit with uh, like all of those recognitions and uh, conferences I show you the slide and, and, and to others as well. Uh, let me quickly go back um, and show what we're going to do here. So our session is scheduled uh, to 7 p.m. EIST and we'll 
will take place for like here and for one hour, for, for one hour. Um, again, we had some introduction for five minutes. Um, then 45 minutes I'm, go I'm going to use to, for presentation and then 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, you can post your question anytime, but of course I'm not going to handle them during the session and I will do it later on after. Uh, all right, so, um, oh, by the way, before, before I start. Um, this session, uh, I treat the session more like a continuation of the previous session where we had a session about uh, and testing challenges when we work with the cloud. Uh, that session was more about, you know, targeted to seep and uh, problem, not problems, but I mean some 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 challenges. Uh, but now we are jumping to the cloud, more to the cloud, and we're going to continue the idea. All right, so we understand the challenges. Uh, what we can do? What? How can we provide? Like, how can we do something? How can we really? Uh, execute some of the like cyber attacks. How can we simulate the behavior of attack of attack attacker, and how can we do a pen test against different cloud services? So you know about me, um, and yeah, if you want to add me on LinkedIn, uh, I'm here. I'm here on the LinkedIn because uh, I, I don't have Twitter. No, that's too much for me to have so many social networks. Um, all right, so let me quickly show you what we had before. If you have been to the session in March, uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you a quick recap what we had, like uh, pen testing challenges. Um, and then we, and then like I'll just make a quick recap and then we're going to start like uh, our new topic and it will be based on live demos as usual because if you've been to my session before, you probably know that I, I really like to show live demos. Uh, so um, when it comes to the, some challenges and, and, and a pen test, you need to know about cloud pen test. You need to know that there is a portion of responsibility on the customer side and the portion on the provider side. Um, here I have a screenshot from AWS, and like you, you might find here what is called shared responsibility. And so when we do a pen test of the cloud services, by the way, I think uh, I again you may be heard from the introduction that I really like to work with Microsoft, and yeah, of course I I know other platforms at least, otherwise I won't be able to get certified as CCSE, mid cloud security engineer. Uh, but Microsoft is one of my my favorite. So I'm going to show you the same similar slide from Microsoft. Um, I like it a bit more, to be fair. So uh, you may find here what is called shared responsibility model, um, and part of responsibility on the customer side. I mean, you and you know your customers. So I mean, Microsoft customers, Microsoft or AWS or GCP customers. So the par part of responsibility on the customer side, and another portion on the provider side. Because if we are talking about on-premises, uh, the full responsibility on the customer side, and we are free. We, can, we if we are pen, pen testers, I mean, we are free. We can do whatever we want. We want. We, if we want to make a physical a pen test, pen test, we can do it. If we want to try to compromise some equipment, we can do it. But now, when we move to the cloud, when customer moves to the cloud, there is a portion of, respons of responsibility on the cust on the on the provider side, like Microsoft or or, or Amazon or Google. And so, of course, you will not be able to test them. Uh, yeah, they have some bug bounty programs, and if you want to make some money uh, on bug bounty, you may try to compromise Microsoft environment. But again, that's a different story. If we're talking about pen test of your customer, you must test what uh, the, the portion that is under customer responsibility. And depends on the cloud cloud model, it may be different uh, level of responsibility, different areas of responsibility. So if we have virtual machines like IaaS, then that may be the areas of responsibility. If we have uh, PaaS services, then air responsibility of customer is lower now. And so you must find misconfigurations on the customer side, not on the Microsoft, because Microsoft should treat it pretty, pretty well. Um, and again, and SaaS, uh, mostly SaaS, refers to compromise of uh, identities, like accounts and identities, uh, the device itself, um, and information that user may share uh, over the cloud services. So again, depends on the customer cloud model. Uh, we may have our pen test uh, really differs, um, and it's really, really important in compare, in co compared to our classic on-premises pen test. And so nowadays, company move to the cloud and they move from on-premises mostly to IaaS because IaaS does the most common for like 
very similar to on-premises. It's still virtual machines. Yeah, we don't have access to physical infrastructure, but we still have virtual machine. But after that period, after they just get used to the cloud, they already have they they have they go through adoption. They start to uh, embrace more like uh, PaaS services and and SaaS services, and so the level of responsibility of provider is is going to be higher, and responsibility level of of customer is lower. So please keep it in mind. And uh, our classic pen test. Uh, techniques, of course, they still work, but not all of them. At the same time, most companies they have hybrid cloud, so they still have on something on premises. So you may try to compromise something on premises, like like you do it before. I mean, compromise or test test, and then uh, from on premises, it, it may it may on premise on prem environment can be used to jump to the cloud environment, like maybe it's like a bridge. At the same time, most companies have multi-cloud strategy, and the problem of multi-cloud, um, it's hard to keep it all well, well configured and, and secure enough. And so more, more environments customers have, uh, the more misconfigurations they, they may also have. And most companies also have hybrid identities, like a co continuation of the idea of hybrid infrastructure. Uh, all of this we, discover, we discussed before on the previous session. Uh, we also uh, talk about something about legal stuff. If something is really um, managed by Microsoft, can we pen test it if we don't have an agreement with Microsoft? We have agreement with customer and customer says, okay, test it. But now you test the environment that also somehow uh, managed by Microsoft. Uh, is that legal or not? Um, so uh, that may be quite big challenge. Also, we don't have physical access. Uh, not all tools may work because it depends on the cloud model. Um, and it depends on the cloud. Uh, each service may look differently. So yeah, virtual machines, they are pretty, pretty much the same. But if you just go to past services, past service implemented in different clouds also differently, like AWS and, um, and uh, Azure or GCP, they, they deploy past services differently and, and manage them differently. Uh, at the same time, um, cloud gives us to pen, uh, like to us the pen testers uh, more opportunities. First of all, uh, public uh, cloud is public by design. So, and if customer didn't really make uh, appropriate configurations, then there is a chance that the service will be exposed, publicly exposed, and you can um, access the service from outside. So, um, because also cloud has many changes, um, for customers maybe a bit tricky to, to like, keep up to date and sometimes like don't apply the right configuration because they are constantly get changed. Um, and we have hybrid most of the time. I mean, customers have hybrid most of the time and that increased attack surface. And there is no single network that may, must be trusted for customer. So they must move to different security strategies, uh, which in the transition period may lower their security. Because if you remember on premises, we have a network that we trust uh, to, uh, but now in the cloud, we don't have a single network. And when we move to different approaches like zero trust strategy, uh, on that way, we companies may have some misconfigurations as well. All right, pretty quickly, what we also covered about legal status. Um, so all providers, AWS, Microsoft, and GCP, allow you to make a pen test. So that's legal. Don't worry about that. There are some restrictions. So take a look at the details because they may not allow you like run DDoS against against the environment. But in general, that's that is. Um, it's, it's legal. So you must focus on something that what that is your level of responsibility, areas for responsibility. Um, and so make a test without violation of rules of engagement. So that's what we discussed on the challenges. And now what I want to do, I would like to show you some of the ideas how different services in the cloud uh, can be tested. So we're going to start from virtual machines, which is like compute service or virtual machine. Then we're going to talk, to take a look at the storage, databases, app services, serverless, containers, KMS, I mean, key management service, uh, and identities. 
Um, I will use an, an example as usual, usually Microsoft, uh, but similar, similarly, you may do the same for other clouds. Similarly, you can do the same from other, for other clouds. So let's start from compute. And uh, for every slide, I'm going to show you first slide and then jump to demo and show you how it can be done. Um, if, if I can show demo, of course, not, not, ev not every demo can be shown ver very quickly. So first of all, uh, compute or virtual machine. This one is the most common, I mean, the, the most similar to on-premises. So we have virtual machine on-premises, we have virtual machine in the cloud. Um, and entry point may be pretty much the same. So there is exposed port, um, like, and, you know, some, someone forgot to close 3389 port, or maybe there is there's a port 80 or 443 and the application itself is vulnerable to some kind of injection or some upload. So it really depends. Um, pretty much the same that you have on premises, the entry point to the, the machine will be similar with, with a few differences. So first of all, this machine probably will not be joined to AD domain. Because when you when you work with your on-premise environment, quite often you sooner or later you reach AD domain, because that's that's the like de facto standard for on-premise environment. At the same time, in the cloud, um, companies very rarely use Active Directory domain like uh, that we used used to have in on-premises, um, and those machines will not be joined to the domain. So uh, machines probably most machines will will be um, uh, tested as standalone machine they may be joined to ad domain they may be joined to uh, azure domain or some other cloud domains but most of the time they're like standalone and not joined to any domains then also one more thing network so network uh, will be like cloud network um, virtual network in the cloud which may be configured differently so it may be flat network uh, when you know all all virtual machines um, can reach to each other, like it can connect to each other, um, or it may be segmented network when company properly configured different segments and they have like a high privilege machines, low privilege machines, and so on. So they they build the right segment. It depends. It depends how they follow the like best best practices and the strategies like like zero trust. So it really depends. Uh, but you need to test it. Uh, and one, one interesting thing that you may find about virtual machines uh, is access to IMDS. Um, so that's the metadata store that av access, uh, available accessible from any virtual machine, even if you don't have admin level access. So if you have any kind of access to virtual machine, even you know, a regular user level ac access, you can execute any code, then you can access um, uh, meta metadata, metadata storage and find out some interesting information, some interesting data in virtual machines. So let me jump to demo as usual and let me show you how it may look like. So first, let me legally uh, connect to virtual machine. So this, this part I don't want to really discuss because maybe brute force, it may be something else. So I need to have entry point and it's quite similar to um, like the same that we have on premises. Now I connected to virtual machine now it doesn't really matter what kind of permissions I have. Um, and what I want to what I want to show I want to show you the difference uh, between on-prem machine and the cloud machine. If I look at them, um, I don't know. Let's say you name uh, it will be Linux. Uh, you name minus A. So that's the Linux machine. Um, that's quite common to see Linux machine uh, on-premise as well. But even if I get the Windows machine, um, that still be st still be Windows standalone machine. So on, uh, in the cloud, we rarely have uh, domain joint machines. You may find this, this machine deployed from for, for Azure. Um, and let me clear the screen. And let me show you one interesting thing. Um, let me show you one interesting thing. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump first to the portal to explain one thing for to those who may not aware, may, may not be aware of this. So in, in uh, uh, clouds, uh, like AWS cloud, uh, Azure cloud, we have the concept of identity for a resource. Identity for resource. It's like uh, if we uh, enable special identity, uh, different clouds call it differently, but that's the identity for the resource. If we enable this identity, 
then all applications that you deploy on virtual machines will have its own identity and you will be able to assign privileges to those applications that you deploy on virtual machine. Um, and that, that, which is pretty nice and, and make our life with developers much easier. So it's very popular for many companies to enable that on virtual machines or other cloud resources, because uh, in that case, the special object with the virtual machine or, or any other resource name will appear um, in the cloud AD. At the same time, if I, if I can compromise virtual machine uh, with enabled identity, let's see what they can do. So um, let me go back to virtual machine. And so let, let me make a uh, very simple request, or a very simple query using curl. And look at this, it show, it showed me a JWT token. If I copy this token, and again, I don't need to, I don't need to be an admin to extract this token. Any kind of access, um, even if I'm just a regular user, will, will, will be enough to, just, to extract this token. Now, if I look at the GWT.ms and take a look at this token, I can find that this token audience, I mean that like a target, is management.azure.com. So it means uh, to manage Azure resources. And uh, this token uh, was assigned to a virtual machine with the name m-lin1. And what I would also I can check for how long this um, token will live. And looks like exp expiration will be in June 9, so tomorrow. Uh, 24 hours. So I have 24 hours to use this token for the compromised machine. And now it depends what kind of privileges assigned to the virtual machine. I can try to use that to access other resources. Um, let me copy this token. Copy this token. And now there's a different many ways to use this token. Um, it, there's a generic way, use, REST, uh, use API or I can try to use management tools. Maybe it's not really the perfect way to show you. Let me just reconnect because my my different my, my second monitor has different resolution. Let me reconnect to show you that normal screen. Yeah, that's better. Um, let me say uh, connect AZ account. So now I'll try to connect to, to Azure. Oh, let me first check uh, get AZ. Uh, what it may be, AZ resource. So what kind of access you have to resources? Should should fail, now it should fail. Yeah, you don't have any access, your credentials are expired, so you need to have credentials. All right, let's try. So let's say um, I would like to connect to AZ account. And instead of using, uh, look, using, using them a password, I will use access token. An account ID is the virtual machine name, um, which is, let me go back to um, here, which is m hyphen lean. I can find it right in the token. Um, one moment, I hope, I hope it will not break line. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, here, oops, sorry, one more space. All right, so now if I try to get a Z resource. I, I have some kind of access. So now I can see there's a storage available to me um, because I have a token. Um, that's something that you will, you will not find on premises, but you may find in the cloud. So the special identities for, for the resources, so like resource identities, and they can be extracted if you compromise one of the compute resource and most commonly it's virtual machines. That's one of the ways you may find with virtual machines. One more thing that you may find, also providers, they try to make um, management of resources um, more convenient and they, uh, they organize management tools in the way that you don't need to log in locally to the virtual machines or, or any other resources. What do I mean by that? If I want to execute command on the virtual machine, I may connect using SSH uh, like, I'm, like I'm doing it now let's say ID, or, or I can find on the portal or through management tools, I can find something like run command, 
And again, we have the similar things in every cloud. Run command. And here I can find a run shell script. Again, if I have enough privileges to open the portal, and yeah, there, there will be uh, like there are some privileges that need to be assigned to me to run this, this script. Uh, but I may not know the username and password to connect to the machine, but I may have privileges on the portal. That's a different set of privileges. And now I can run something like ID. Again, it, it, it takes some time, so maybe not right now, but it, because first it will send the script to the virtual machine, execute it. But the, the, but the key here that you, you will see that the execution will happen with the root privileges. So because um, cloud providers, they try to like move management tools from the from the machine itself to the portal or to or to like or command line man, management tools that, that that branded by them i mean microsoft management tools or aws management tools oh look at this so i can execute that with the root permissions um that's why if we can get access to management tools then we can get access to the actual uh resources so again uh, virtual machines, that's the most common, I mean, the most uh, similar to on-premises resource, uh, but there, there's still some differences. There are still some differences, similar sim similarities and differences. Um, so if on-premises you compromise the machine and you, now you start to um, just jump around the domain and to find out more credentials, other users try to compromise the main admin. Here, of course, lateral movement we will still have, but now we go going to pivot across um, standalone machines. All right, that's the first part. I mean, first resource type, uh, virtual machines. Let's take a look at the next one, storage. So in AWS, they call it S3, uh, Microsoft Storage Storage Account, so it really depends. Probably you heard a lot, may, those be support many times. So in storage, uh, now store, storage by itself compromise, I'm not sure if you can, but the data that's stored in the storage quite often can be publicly available. Not, maybe not so often like, like, like it used to be like 10 years ago, but still uh, it's popular. And maybe you heard this quite, quite, quite famous story when uh, some nation states stored data about uh, how they spy on uh, their citizens. citizens um, and they store that data on the publicly available cloud storage and once that storage was found, and then they, they, that data became well known. Uh, anyway, so storage. Um, in storage, we're trying to find out this publicly accessible data. Uh, here, uh, the, one of the most simple things that we can do uh, is to use something like DearBuster or GoBuster. Uh, DearBuster, GoBuster, uh, to use dictionary-based attack, like, like we do it on premises against web applications, here we can try to brute force um, the files available on public storage. So if you know, um, if you know that there is a storage um, and data there on, on the storage is publicly accessible, you may try to use some dictionary, uh, like dictionary attacks. Let me give you one of the example of uh, publicly accessible storage. One moment. One moment. Um, um all right so that's the right publication all right so let me just do it to you um let's say we will take uh, amazon store um and yeah that's the amazon application but if you if you if i right click on the uh, uh image and i take an image link uh, I can find here that probably it's stored on the different storage. Let's see. Yeah, so there's a storage uh, called M Media Amazon Com. Yeah, so here's pretty pretty hard to brute force because names are randomized. Um, we can also copy another name. Let's create a clip here. Uh, copy image link. Yeah, so pretty hard to brute force because names are not predictable. Uh, but it, it depends on the on the on the company and on the, and, the, and the data stored on, on on the storage. So if names are predictable and based on dictionary words, 
then we can just start like Deer Buster, Go Buster, and all, all those kind of Buster applications. Uh, that can just use a dictionary, brute force different names, and find out which name is available. And so that's the way to find out some hidden files that are not um, may customer may don't want to uh, expose, didn't didn't want to expose. Uh, also, what may be done uh, when someone wants to generate the link um, to uh, to legally share data, those links may be overprivileged. Let me quickly show you what I mean here. So let me go back to the portal, and let's say, let me just find out, it's me, the storage I showed you before. Let's say I would like to, 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 to um, create link and give some kind of access, give some kind of, kind of access to one of the users. But at the same time, when I configure the link, I just check all the boxes and just, let's say, generate, uh, generate SAS. Um, and so here's the link to um, here's the link with with some kind of access. And if I look at if I try to leak, read this link, I can find out that it gives access to all services, which is blah files, SKUs, and tables, with all kind of um, resource types, which means service, container, object, with all kind of privileges. Yeah, probably in the real world you will not find that someone did like that. But uh, when you when you compare the link that must be like give, must give you some kind of access, and look at the, uh, 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 look look at the permissions, you may find something extras. So for example, maybe there is a list permission, and you will be able to list other blobs in this container. Uh, so again, a misconfigured link because someone who created this link wasn't really accurate with permissions. Um, and so when you analyze the link, you may find out some extra permissions. All right, so that's the storage. Storage. Uh, let's jump over the next service. Uh, we have like, yeah, 20, 20 minutes should be enough to, to, to cover all of that, all, all, all those services. So uh, next one will be database. Database. Um, database is past service. Uh, pass service. So compromise the underlying uh, infrastructure probably will be hard. So uh, because uh, that's, that's it's managed by Microsoft uh, or Amazon or uh, Google. So you will not be able to really uh, hack the actual machine where the SQL server or MySQL server is running on. Um, so you need to find something else. So first of all, of course, if, if you to, to, to detect the database service, um, you, you may just use the like um, public pu public pu public services like you know like Shodan and, and so on because all of those um, ports are still open. Um, let me just give you a quick example. So f let me find out um, SQL database in the cloud and let me just. Click on the server and copy the server name. And now, if I take something like open my Kali machine and and take nmap, um, let me place that that name port. Let's say one four three three, um, and let's try pn. And now it's showing me that port is open. Um, so even if it, that the service is managed by Microsoft or Amazon or any other any other provider, uh, there's still known ports still be accessible. So I can try to access it. I can try to access it. You may say, wait a second, uh, why it's working? Um, uh, why port is open for everyone? Is, is that normal that backend service uh, has port open for everyone? And that may be one of the misconfigurations. Um, because there are different ways to open this port, uh, different ways to open the port. Um, in my case, I allow access to this port from any address that's available in the in Microsoft Cloud. And so, because I do it from Microsoft Cloud, Microsoft Virtual Machine, this port seems to be open for me just because I'm doing I'm doing I'm trying to pen test from the Microsoft Virtual Machine. Uh, all right, so let me just go back to slides. Um, and so, uh, but the compromised database itself uh, will be pretty complicated. So, first of all, 
yeah, maybe you have credentials and you can connect to the database of credentials. Uh, but how can you get those credentials? Most of the time, it will be, so first of all, identity-based attacks, like, you know, the regular brute force is still the case. But most of the time, we try to get into database using um, related services. Because backend by itself will not exist, uh, so backend will not ex exist by itself. So if we have backend database, something must connect to it, and something should have those credentials. So for example, if there is a web application, I'm, I'm simple, of course, I'm simplifying, but if that's the web application, and the web application must connect to the database, how this web application is going to authenticate, to access the database? Um, so there are different ways to, 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 to authenticate, and so that's what we can try to do. Um, compromise another service, because backend service quite often uh, better configured, more securely configured, compared to front-end services. Uh, and it's like not that likely that backend service will be publicly exposed. Um, so data, database, again, database service is backend and may not be publicly accessible. Um, it, it, even by default, there is a, like some, some firewalls on databases and you must explicitly allow connection to them. So to compromise database, to, te to test database, again, compromise test, um, in, in a pen test, there's not always the goal to compromise. We need to test it. Um, so the test database, we can try to do it from other services. So even though another, another service has been compromised, we can we can try to do it from another service if like um, can do it from front end. That's why I'm going to move to the next slide where we're going to talk about app service. App service. So app service, um, that's like a web application, and web application can be vulnerable to typical OWASP top 10 attacks. That's the first thing that, that, that might happen with, uh, with the app service itself. So application application has vulnerabilities by itself. And uh, through this application, you may also try to connect to database. Let me show you one thing, um, one application, one application. Uh, with vulnerability. Oops. Oh no. Go back. And I'm going to to to, to app services. And that's the application. Um, by the way, that's not my application. That was oops. Uh, that was built by another person known known uh, the author of the service. Um, have I been pwned? So the author of the service uh, also built this application for, so you, you may deploy it yourself, by the way, it's publicly available on his GitHub. So here's the application, and on purpose, this application is vulnerable. Um, so if I try like simple SQL injection, now I, I was able to reach a database from this application. And if I can, can compromise the application by itself, the, the, the platform, I can do something else on the on, on with the database, not only through uh, not only SQL injection through the interface, but also um, I can have more access to backend service if the uh, if the if the frontend was compromised. At the same time, if we have some kind of access on the management side to the, on the on the application level, uh, I mean on the management level, we can also use um, overlooked deployment methods. Because developers can deploy code, application code, in many ways. Um, so FTP, um, which is, I'm not sure if anyone is still doing that. Um, FTP, uh, like GitHub, and like, of course, CICD, that's, that's the most common way to, to make a deployment. At the same time, uh, there are methods, uh, methods like FTP may still be enabled. And so, Maybe if no one used that, there are still deployment methods that's still enabled, and you can use them to connect to the application and change code uh, to and something deploy the code that you want with with your Trojans with with the level of access you want. Let me quickly show you the idea uh, how it may look like. Um, I'm going to access application itself, and um, so. Here I can find out, oh, let me just show you the, the deployment center. Uh, 
And here I can find out that FTP credentials some available somewhere here. I can click. Uh, it might take some time to generate them. Okay, so now generate for me FTP endpoint, a username, and the password. Now, if I open uh, the virtual machine where I have um, FTP client, uh, where's my FileZilla? FileZilla. And now, if I uh, copied that part, place here, um, the username. And the password, click OK. And now look at this. I have access to the application, uh, like a, to the application itself. And now, of course, I can upload my code, uh, my web pages, um, access to database. I can upload shell, by the way, I already did that. Uh, so I can upload my shell and, and so on and so on. Um, so now I'm free to make any modifications with this web application just because I have access on FTP level. And that's the different access level, different access level that I need um, to access application normally. So some of the things can be overlooked. Um, and so someone else, attacker or I don't know, uh, internal user with malicious intent can use, can, can, can use them. All right, so next will be serverless, which is, I would say, that can be compromised in pretty much the same manner. Uh, so serverless, if probably you, you know what it is, that's when we just execute our code um, and we're trying to not to pay and not to manage infrastructure, and we, ma we manage only our code. Um, so it's pretty convenient and the attackers will not be able to, com to compromise uh, uh, the infrastructure and you as the pen tester will not be able to compromise the co test infrastructure. But there is a code. There is a code that will be deployed somehow. And again, many deployment methods, and some of those methods can be overlooked. And also, like FTP can be uh, turned on, or other deployment methods that can be overlooked. Um, and you, as a tester, you can try to use them and check if you have any access there. All right, there are a few more methods. Um, next will be containers. Uh, containers. So containers nowadays is very popular thing. And when we deploy containers, uh, when we deploy containers, we use um, our own repository for container images because we want to deploy container from image. Of course, we, we deploy containers from images. Um, and so con um, we have all, we have only we have our own repository, which may call which may call for different providers may may call differently. So hub, per registry, something like this. And what may be the key here, the registry hub uh, may be not properly configured. And so pen tester, attacker pen tester, you name it, uh, will be able to download or upload images. Even better way when, when he or she can download and upload images. In that case, I will be able to download the image, unzip it, Trojan, place my Trojan and zip it again and upload. So in that case, um, my, my uh, Trojan can be executed. So uh, it takes time to show you that. I already um, upload my container image. Oops, sorry. I already upload container image. Let me configure the listener. It should have it should have Trojan already, um, and image already there. Uh, let me quickly show you. If I go to container registry registry and scroll to repositories, um, here's my repository with name hello w. If I click on that, it shows me that. Um, I upload today, just right before the webinar. Um, it should be Trojanized. At least I, pl I place it there. But to be fair, not, not yet tested. So cross your fingers. Um, cross your fingers. Now, 
um, let me try, try to deploy it. Like so, users, company may not know that their image has been com has been compromised and trojanized. Let me try to make a deployment. Let me say like uh, AC console. Okay. Um, .ci. And I'm going to take my image from registry. Click create. Click create. All right. Uh, fingers crossed that my Trojan is working. Um, it might take a few, like around a minute before um, application will be deployed. By the way, while while waiting, let me quickly show you how the image may look like. Uh, if I connect the machine, um, the image itself is it, when we download it, it will be like a uh, just like a, like an archive, and if we, if we unzip it, um, we'll find many folders, and each folder contain um, one more tar file, which is the layers, and if you unzip that, you may find the actual um, actual files, um, and here yeah, so var and other USR has been and so on. All right, so let's see. Oh yeah, look at this. So um, um, let's try. Alas, uh, I have access now to the actual container, just because container was was deployed from the vulnerable image. But for the companies, it's still application that still work. Um, if it's already uh, fire, uh, working, again, it might take a few minutes before I can see the page, but let, let fingers crossed. Yeah, hello world. So it's still working application, but uh, behind the scenes, it gives me access to, oops, sorry, it's not the right machine. It gives me access to the actual container. Uh, all right, let me go back. Uh, we are close to the finish. We have three minutes left before before q a so there are two more services left uh key management service that's where we store our keys encryption keys uh um maybe kms permissions on kms are misconfigured but that's not common so uh, companies understand that uh, key management service is very sensitive and they configure privileges most of the time very very uh clearly um, and uh, they don't allow access to anyone, to, to most administrators, to KMS. At the same time, what sometimes can be misconfigured, uh, services that must have access to KMS. So um, service has access to KMS, uh, and the, but the permissions on the service level are misconfigured. So for, for, for example, let me go back to a few more slides back. Let's, let's say serverless. There will be some code that need, needs to that needs needs access to keys, and maybe on this level we can change the code, and uh, not just use key, but maybe a rotate key or do something else with key. So uh, the the keys KMS KMS itself usually configured pretty pretty well, but the services that also has access to KMS already may be not properly configured. So maybe permissions on the ser of, of service on the KMS level is fine, but the service itself is not uh, well protected, like serverless application or maybe some web application that has access to Q KMS. K KMS. Uh, as the result, first get access to compromise the service and uh, get access to uh, key management service. And the last one, Last one, identities. So with identities, probably it's like pretty straightforward. Brute force, parcel spray, most of the time. Brute force is pretty hard because again, uh, provider for identities will be in the cloud. Um, and cloud providers, they are pretty strict with brute force. But parcel spray still may work because really it may, detect, it may, it may get detected, but still um, can work. Uh, fission, that's the most common that we have for identities. So like send the, to, to a form to user and say, hey, dear user, please provide your username and password because you need to get authenticated somewhere. 
Uh, and one, one last thing, um, for hybrid environment, it may be e easier to compromise on-prem identity and from on-prem get access to the cloud. Because uh, if we have hybrid, so they are uh, interconnected. And so one environment give you, give you keys to another environment. Of course, it depends on the, on the segmentation and, and many, many other things, but quite often, it, one, one on-prem identity allows you to have access to cloud identity, cloud environment. All right, so now, 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 oh, now we reach to the perfectly on time and we have exactly 10 minutes for your Q&A. So, uh, but let me just quickly re re recap, uh, like, I mean, not recap, but tell you what, 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 did, what did you did. Let me go back, back up to the bottom of the slides. Um, so we discussed different services, how they can be tested and let's say compromised. Um, and yeah, very briefly, but I hope it gives you some ideas about that. All right, so now I'm ready for your questions if you have them. Now Thank you perfectly. so much. Now I have again. nine minutes. All right. <laughs> sure, actually. Uh, thank you so much, Sergey. Actually, your session was so informative. Because of that, we didn't get much question, but we have received so many like. Uh, thank you and uh, that they want the session recording in the q and if you have got bye bye. <laughs> but uh, before we start our q and a i would like to inform our audience that today's webinar is in sync with our ccsc certification ec council launched a first of its kind cloud security program the certificate Certified Cloud Security Engineer Certification designed and developed by cloud security professionals. CCSC is a specialized program curated by cloud security professionals in collaboration with subject matter experts from across the globe. A hands-on learning certification course, CCSC adopts a detailed and methodological approach to teach fundamental concepts on cloud security. EC Council's CCSC program is a blend of vendor neutral and vendor specific cloud security concepts that offer aspirants and learning approach if you are interested to know more kindly take part in the poll which is going to be conducted now let us know your preferred mode of training and we will reach out to you yes sir please continue should, should, should i choose anything because on my <laughs> screen also should show me that i oh, participate in the poll yeah but asked. It GCSE. is only for the audience. <laughs> you cannot. I, I have it already. Oh, okay. I, so, I mean, I have CCSE already. Yes. <laughs> so before, uh, right now, we will take the question. Our first question is: How can AI help us? Uh, just a second. How? What? Yeah. How? How? How can? How can AI helps us achieve a stronger security defense against network attacks. All right. Uh, so many providers nowadays, they um, implement artificial intelligence uh, and they have like number of features that help you to make it hard, like hardening better with, uh, with intelligence. Uh, just very 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 quickly because we are quite limited in time so for example if i go to like my my azure cloud and oh come on why are you doing that when, when we don't have time uh so there's like like one of the features adaptive network hardening that analyze my traffic that goes to my applications uh, and compare with my uh, security configuration and say look looks like you're over permissive so you, you connect legally from these ip addresses but you allow connection from larger number of ip addresses hmm that's that's pretty bad idea just to refresh um maybe it'll be better uh so yeah ai now of course um so 
um, if, if I look at the, so here it looks like there's no unhealthy, I'm pretty fine, uh, but uh, in this case, again, it will analyze my traffic and just try to tell me what I'm doing wrong, but it looks like I'm doing everything right, they're, they're all healthy. Um, and uh, you may find number of those things in across different providers when they um, analyze like for um, uh, password spray, um, network connections, um, and, and many other things. Um, yeah, so AI now more and more used in the for in the, in the cloud products, and for for cloud providers, it's easier to deploy it because it's like you know that's that centralized service compared to you know, like something on premise that we need to they need to release the new version and you must install it. For cloud providers, it's a bit easier to implement. Thank you so much, Sergey. Our next question is: What are the most common vulnerabilities in cloud environments? Uh, good question. So in general, uh, when we talk about vulnerabilities, it means that uh, it's something like uh, like a bug. Um, and uh, most of the time, what, we've, what, 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 what I found and what Pantesters found is like misconfigurations. Um, when companies didn't properly configure the networking or, or and they have some open ports, uh, but um, most, if we're talking, if you're asking about vulnerabilities specifically, then it really depends on the time. So if you remember log for log for J, then we had log for J in the cloud deploy, and that time it was very popular. Then uh, it depends on, uh, based on waves. So there's a wave with one vulnerability, another wave with another vulnerability. But some that we may have persistent is misconfigurations when they just didn't properly implement hardening. Thank you, Survey. Uh, we have one question. Uh, public domain, mostly companies do SEO, SMO, and keep data file names easy keyword basis. Is it unsecure to upload on hosting server? Can you please repeat the question? I didn't really get the beginning of the question. Yeah, so uh, people use public domain for yep. mostly companies SEO and SMO, which is search engine optimization or search uh, engine marketing. So, uh, and keep data file names easy keyword basis. Is it unsecure or insecure to upload on hosting server? Uh, of course. Um, so there are, you probably you probably heard about this. I don't know heard about it or not, but uh, search engines they will try to index it. Um, and maybe heard about Google Foo. Um, if you haven't heard, just 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 Google about Google Foo. What Google Foo is? Um, it's like a number of queries we can we like search search queries we can use to find out some uh, hidden data. So a company may public like just place some file on the on on the web server. On the on the host, and maybe if there's if there's no link, but Google still index that, and you may try to find it uh, with what is called Google Foo. And if you look at them, um, exploit DB, there's an even special uh, um, special part of uh, exploit DB with, about Google Foo. Let me try it. ExploitDB.com. Um, so, GHDB, Google Hacking Database. It's not how, how to hack Google, but that's some queries in Google that we can use to try to find more data. So, yeah, don't place anything on the host if you don't want for others to, to find it. If it's something sensitive, don't place it there. Thank you so much. We are taking our last question, which is how to conduct pen tests, conduct a pen test in a cloud environment that is highly dynamic. I would like to know what means highly dynamic. Probably uh, my guesses, my guesses, uh, they mean that applicate like some kind of Oh, what, what exactly it means highly dynamic? That, that that the vendor makes changes in the services 
or the customer deployment um, um, in their CI CD pipeline changed based on microservices. I don't know what they mean, to be fair. Um, so I will try to give a generic gener generic answer. Cloud gives challenges not only to um, customers that they, they must uh, keep up to date, but also the pet testers. So uh, try to adapt. But again, I'm not really sure what exactly you mean by highly dynamic. So um, adapt to changes. Uh, and I hope that was the answer to your question. Thank you so much, Sergey. Uh actually it was really uh, informative session and thank you uh, once again to our audience uh, before we conclude uh, the webinar uh, sage would you like to give a small message to our audience hmm. good question um probably let me, I, I, I can i can i can give them your message uh subscribe to ccse um, uh, anyway, so um, uh, just just keep in mind that uh, cloud pen test is something that uh, quite often for for many pen testers it's something that they do not get used to. But again, the more companies move to the cloud, and you cannot just say, "Oh, uh, I will do it later." So let me continue to pen test applications and uh, like what 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 for, for what we used for, to do for for a long time. Uh, the more and more companies move to the cloud and just soon, sooner or later, you have to adapt. So start to work with the cloud uh, as soon as possible because the more you're waiting, the more uh, things you, you're missing. Thank you so much for your message uh, to our audience again. And to our audience, thank you. We have got so many uh, posts tagging us and with the hashtag of EC Council and Cyber Talks, we will be connecting with you uh, over the social media and we will be sharing the handouts. We would love to uh, like request you all, uh, once you receive the handouts, please post that as well, tagging Cyber Talks and EC Council. Before we end the session, I would like to announce our next Cyber Talk session, which is the future of digital forensics, trends, and emerging technologies is scheduled for 9th June 2023. The session is a fireside chat by Arun Soni and Dr. Santosh Khatsare. To register uh, for this session, please go to our website which is www.eccu.edu slash cyber hash dot uh, talk slash uh, the link is given in the chat section hope to see you all tomorrow that is 9th june and with this we end the session you all may disconnect your line thank you so much thank you very much see you next time bye bye <laughs>